Tonight's a really interesting topic. So as I said, the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation in collaboration with UCI Health, hopefully you've stopped by the UCI Health table in the back, is pleased to present Medicine in Our Backyard. This series features an extraordinary group of renowned doctors and researchers who are making profound discoveries right in our backyard at UC Irvine. We thank UCI, L uh, UCI Health as well as Mike and Polly Smith who are foundation members who go above and beyond their membership to make this program possible for all of us tonight. I'm sure everyone in this room um, this evening has experienced a loved one with some form of age-related neurological disorders. In the battle against Alzheimer's disease, Dr. Joshua Grill invokes a deceased jazz singer, iPods, and a 35,000-year-old vulture bone that cavemen fashioned into a flute. Grill is a neuroscientist whose research interests focus on clinical trials and neurodegenerative disease. He will explain how music is a powerful force and that can tap into the deepest recesses of the mind, stir emotions, and conjure memories, and why music memory is one of the last things affected by Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Grill is an associate professor in psychiatry in the Psychiatry and Human Behavior School of Medicine and an associate professor in the Neurobiology and Behavior School of Biological Sciences at UC Irvine. He received the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center Junior Investigator Award, that's a mouthful, <laughs> the Alzheimer's Association Turkin Research Prize, and the Community Spirit Award from OPICA Adult Day Service adult day services, and many, many other accolades. Uh, um, his research has been funded by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, the Alzheimer's Association, the Hartford Foundation, and the American Federation for Aging Research. He serves um, on the steering committee of the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study and the Internal Ethics Committee for the, this national body. He is also a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for Maria Shiver's Women Alzheimer's Movement. Dr. Grill is part of a working group sponsored by the National Institute on Aging and the Alzheimer's Association charged with creating a national strategy for recruitment to Alzheimer's disease clinical research. We definitely have an expert in the room, so come on up. Welcome, Dr. Grill. Uh, good, good evening. Um, like you, I was waiting for that to get over with. That was just too much. Uh, I uh, am thrilled to be here at the Newport Library. My name is Josh Grill. I'm an Alzheimer's researcher at UCI Mind. Um, mostly what I spend my time doing is Alzheimer's disease research as it relates to understanding this disease and finding ways to better treat uh, this disease and other age-related disorders. But tonight I'm going to focus on something different and something admittedly near and dear to my heart and I'm guessing near and dear to the heart of many of you. And that's music and the role of music in, in dementia. Um, I'm going to start playing this video because we had a little bit of trouble of, with it earlier, um, but I'm going to talk over the beginning of it. And I want to say that the, the inspiration I for tonight's talk is really my interaction with uh, Dan Cohen, as much as I who's tried, a social I worker in Long Island, New York, and started no a nonprofit tried, organization work, called works. Music and Memory. We, you may have heard the film eyes, from which this clip is taken, like. Alive Inside. And if you it haven't had amazing. opportunity, I, I strongly I recommend it. Dan has made it his personal mission her, her to bring personalized music space. therapy to every person okay, in a nursing stop. home no. in the United States and beyond. He's an admirable figure. and. Um, when I heard about his program, I was actually working at UCLA, and I decided if, if anybody's going to help this guy, it's going to be us. Um, I was working in Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and we started a, a charitable program where people could donate iPods and iTunes gift cards, and we would turn around and donate them to local nursing homes that we had vetted. And I think you'll agree that okay, the content in this video How I'm about to show you, uh, um, and hopefully the content of this evening's lecture is truly inspirational, and I hope by the end of tonight's talk you'll be 
like I, um, you know, eager to make sure singing, that we bring music know, into the lives of every person with dementia. Would come out with a song, no matter so I'm going to turn up the volume now. I remember as a child, he used to walk us down the street, me and my brother, and he'd stop and sing the rain, he would have us jumping and swinging. Henry's a dementia patient in a nursing home in New York. He was always into music. His daughter's telling about when he was a younger man and her parents, um, he was into music. And now that's Dan Cohen, a professional caregiver at the facility, and they're working on a playlist for Henry. Because he enjoys music and he always swore in the Bible. So I'd rather have that for him. We first see Henry inert, maybe depressed, unresponsive, and almost unalive. Henry! Yeah. Then he is given an iPod containing, we know, his favorite music. And immediately he, he lights up. His, his face assumes expression, his eyes open wide. He, uh, he starts to, um, to sing and to walk and to move his arms and he's being animated by the music. And he used to always sit on the unit with his head like this. He didn't really talk to much people. And then when I introduced the music to him, this is his, his reaction every since. <laughs> So I think you understand where they came up with the title Alive Inside. And Henry, Henry was um, being brought to life. Yeah. I'm going to take the music for one second, okay? Just to ask you a few questions. Non responsive okay? for the most part until I'm gonna give it back he to had you. music uh -huh. put okay. into his the ears. This stop. The video goes on and Henry's uh, asked a few questions after listening off. to the music. He's uh, much more animated, Henry much more responsive, much more verbal. He even recalls some of his favorite artists, Cab Calloway, top yeah. on the list. Um, um, we also heard from like Oliver Sacks, iPod? who you like the music sadly you're was uh, passed yeah. away a few years Tell ago, but a very famous neurologist who well, wrote the book Musicophilia that I'll quote later. But you can see that music, of course, do you like music? Has a profound impact. I'm about music. And the point of this talk is, is why is that and how can we learn from it? So what I'll try to do in about an hour is walk you through some basic understanding of the neuroscience of music. What does music do to the brain that enables this remarkable response? I'll talk about the role of music in disease and in healthcare. And then I'll conclude by talking about music and dementia, what we understand about the role of music in the neurodegenerative brain, and I'll propose for you a hypothesis around um, studies that I believe we should do to, to demonstrate that music can be a powerful treatment for people with Alzheimer's disease. So um, the introduction referenced um, this apparatus, which is indeed a vulture radius bone, carbon dated back 30,000 years discovered in the um, uh, regions currently uh, considered Germany and France. There have been um, a handful of musical instruments like this one from bones or um, tusks of mammoths. What's remarkable about this piece is in addition to being wonderfully preserved, we can see that it was carefully crafted by human beings bordering on um, Paleolithic times. So when, Ameri when human beings were first creating agriculture and doing cave drawings, they were taking the time to create musical instruments. You may not be able to see that the holes actually have straight lines indicating that the person who created it measured the distance at which they should be placed. Um, and it demonstrates that essentially as far back as we can go in our history, there was music. 
It's hypothesized that these people used music to create social networks, which may have enabled their survival, communities. But throughout modern history, music remains ubiquitous. Every culture, every geographic region, every humankind has music. Why is that? Why is this conserved? We don't eat it. Barry White aside, it doesn't necessarily help us reproduce. <laughs> what keeps music in our, our humankind? It's powerful. It helps us. It can help us organize. It can help us work together. Perhaps it can help us heal. I took this image from a classic neuroscience text, Kendall, Schwartz, and Jessel. It outlines the pathway by which information enters the ear, is transduced into an electrical signal, carried up the eighth cranial nerve into the brainstem where sound localization is primarily performed, synapses in the thalamus at the medial geniculate nucleus, and then is sent to what we call the primary auditory cortex, or Heschel's gyrus. From there, sound information travels into association cortices. But if it's musical information, the information affects far more regions of the brain. Modern studies using neuroimaging, case studies of people who suffer from musical disorders, an inability to appreciate music, an inability to interpret music. Collectively, these types of studies, this body of literature, have helped us begin to map out the distribution of brain networks that are affected by hearing music. This is a beautiful article, um, including really one of the pioneers in understanding music and dementia, Jason Warren at University College London, where they tried to outline the different brain regions involved in different aspects of music. And certain things like pitch seem to be essentially processed as are other sounds, whereas rhythm and certainly the emotional context of music are able to activate the brain in highly unique ways. This unique capacity of music to activate the brain appears to be present from birth. Here are functional neuroimaging studies looking at infants played music or a series of atonal sounds. In both cases, the effects on the brain are compared to silence. And you can see in panel A, the activation associated with music compared to panel B, which is sounds that have been altered to no longer be musical but are matched for rhythm, pitch, and volume, you can see that the, the brain is far more activated in the areas associated with interpreting sound information. And in these atonal sounds, we get opposite hemisphere activation missing in music. So even before we can speak, our brain interprets music uniquely compared to other sounds. Now much of this talk is based on the miraculous work by Robert Zatori, the true leader in, internationally in understanding the neuroscience of music. He's at the Montreal Neurologic Institute 
and has performed a number of essential studies, and I should note um, the illustration on the title slide of my talk came from a New York Times article that Zatori wrote several years ago that I would highly recommend. Zatori studies reward systems in the brain and has performed a series of incredibly complex but elegant studies to understand why it is that music remains emblazoned in human societies. Among his studies, he performed one similar to that in the infants, playing for young human volunteers, what we term consonant music, as well as dissonant music. You can see that people's ratings of pleasure related to the amount of dissonance in the song is, as I saw represented in many of our audience members, um, essentially linear. The more consonant the music, the more pleasurable it is. And he showed that he could show correlations not only in people's perceived pleasure related to those pieces of music, six different ones in his study, he could show correlations in brain activity. Now this was a, a PET study, positron emission tomography. It um, shows us activation quite well, but doesn't give us quite the same level of sensitivity as does MRI in looking at specific and smaller brain regions. He went on to study this concept in more depth. In this case, looking at um, again, young but uh, college-age volunteers who had extensive training in, in musical performance. And in, in particular, he asked for um, volunteers for this study who could reliably predict that a piece of music would sp send chills down their spine or, or, or give them the chills. Um, how many of you have a piece of music that gives you the chills? probably why you're at this talk. Um, I really like some of the examples listed here. Um, m the mode, to use a statistical term, the most common um, form of music that gave people the chills was in fact classical music. So we, we, we see Mozart and Beethoven. Um, we've got one Pink Floyd uh, represented in here. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know all these bands, but I, I'm intent on Googling Vicious Delicious by Infected Mushroom. Um, actually, that gives me the chills just talking about it. Uh, so in any case, these folks could, could tell Zatori and his colleagues that I'm trained in music, I understand music, and, and, I, and I have such a deep appreciation for music that certain pieces of music elicit a visceral response in me. And in fact, he categorized these visceral responses excuse me, responses in the form of measuring people's skin conductance, their heart rate, uh, et cetera. They had a physiological response. And, and the elegance of this experiment is the control group. For the person who loves Mozart, the control is infected mushroom. For the person who loves infected mushroom, the control is, is Mozart and Beethoven. So it's, a, it's a, an elegant and brilliant design. He showed that when people say they're experiencing the chills from a piece of music, they are in fact having an overt physiological response to that piece. And he went on, of course, to then do neuroimaging in these uh, individuals in a smaller sample who had the strongest, most reliable prediction of these autonomic responses in the body and showed that numerous brain regions were activated when a person listened to music that gave them the chills. And I, I kind of skipped to the punchline, Zatori studies reward circuitry. He found that the parts of our brain that respond to reward, the parts of our brain that tell us, do that again, the parts of our brain that 
evolutionarily kept us going as a species were activated by music. These are the parts of the brain that respond to cocaine and drugs of abuse. They're the parts of the brain that respond to sex. I'm very confident my wife's brain in these regions lights, like, lights up like a Christmas tree when she purchases shoes. <laughs> we, we call this the striatum, the ventral striatum to be more specific, the reward circuitry of the brain. And Zatori showed that in people with classical training in music, who could reliably predict that a piece of music would give them the chills, they experience a reward phenomenon in their brains. But only about half of you raised your hands when I said, how many of you have a piece of music that can give you the chills? Is this, oh, I should, I should say before I get there, um, other studies went on to use more sensitive neuroimaging um, specifically functional magnetic resonance imaging to improve the granularity of understanding specific parts of the brain and um, in particular um, this structure the nucleus accumbens which is part of the striatum and it um, is known to be highly dopaminergic the, the the neurons in the nucleus accumbens express receptors for a chemical called dopamine how many of you have ever heard of dopamine we often associate it with eating chocolate. Again, my wife doesn't like chocolate that much, so shoes it is. Um, but this is, this is dop dopaminergic reward circuitry of the brain. And um, Daniel Levitin, another um, profound leader in the study of neuroscience of music, had shown using fMRI that the nucleus accumbens could be activated by pleasurable music as well. In his most uh, recent studies, um, Zatori has confirmed that dopamine is critical to this processing of musical rewards using a very specific type of PET scan that measures um, dopamine receptor activation called raclopride, raclopride PET. Um, but more importantly, he moved on to say, is this a phenomenon that's unique to people with such musical training that they can reliably predict they'll get the chills from a piece of music. So in his most recent experiment, he took all college kids in the hip Montreal music scene, um, and he played 60 different bands that they had never heard before. Um, I was really proud as a young, hip neuroscientist to recognize some of these bands. Um, sadly, only about 10% of them. Um, I didn't get any junior investigator awards anytime recently. Um, but you can see what's novel about this study then is we're exposing non-trained volunteers, admittedly people who responded to an advertisement about being in a study of music, but these are not classically trained musicians. And we're exposing them, I should say, Zatori is exposing them to a large library of different pieces of music that they had never heard before. And he put them in a scanner, and in another elegant demonstration of methodology, he played the pieces of music for them, and he asked them, how much would you be willing to pay to purchase that song on a song sharing platform, iTunes, if you will. And they chose between, I wouldn't pay one red penny for this song, probably what we would be willing to pay for whatever the mushroom one was, um, 99 cents, $1.29, or $2. And as a scientist, the data are near unbelievable because they're so perfect. What he showed is that the activation in the nucleus accumbens and the caudate nucleus, another part of the striatum, were near perfectly correlated with the amount that someone was willing to spend for a piece of music. So you don't have to be a classically trained musician to have a reward circuitry response to a piece of music that you've never even heard before. Interestingly, this 
caudate and connections with the other side of the brain were not only about pleasure, but also um, the activation actually anticipated the activation in the accumbens. And this suggests that in addition to deriving pleasure from the music, one of the things that we really enjoy is the predictable nature of it, almost a familiarity with a piece of music that we've never heard before. Um, I think that that's really interesting. So remember the nucleus accumbens, remember the striatum, remember dopamine, I'm gonna come back to it. A little more about music and, and brain disease. So um, let me adjust my volume. A trivia question. What do these two songs have in common? Song one. The girl them skill or chip. Thunderball, some give it to, some give it to, some give it to, to our girls. Five million and forty naughty shorty. Baby girl, I'm a girl, I'm a girl. Thunderball say, well, I'm on the way the time. Cool, I wanna be keeping you warm. I got the right. Good beat. Song two. I saw you dancing on that hot and crowded floor. Oops. Don't want to give it away. What do these two songs have in common? The first song was Sean Paul. It's called Temperature. It actually won a Grammy. Not last night, but in 2007 for Hip Hop Album of the Year, peaked at number one. The second song was The Dooleys, 1977, peaked at number 13 on the UK charts. Slightly different eras. Any guesses? What do they have in common? Rhythm, beat, yeah, they, they both, beats per minutes. Um, they are both songs in the medical literature documented for having caused seizures in what's known as musicogenic epilepsy. <laughs> Temperature by Sean Paul was actually the song that first was recognized by Stacy Gale, who's in the photograph here, um, as causing her seizures. And it was in the summer where that song peaked at the top of the charts, so this was happening a lot. Um, her musicogenic epilepsy actually expanded from there. It began to hit her for other hip hop songs. The Rihanna song, Umbrella, was also prominent that summer and began giving her seizures. It got worse from there to the point of ringtones being able to cause seizures in her. She dropped out of school. Um, she was ready to give up um, until she was um, placed in a, an epilepsy ward to try to understand and locate the foci of her seizures. Um, in these wards, the, they actually are monitoring patients until they experience a seizure with high density EEG and other recording devices um, to try to understand where the seizure begins in the brain. And she was deprived of medications, she was uh, essentially deprived of sleep, and she just wasn't having any seizures. Um, eventually she said, out of frustration, give me my purse and my iPod. And because she could give herself a seizure when, whenever she wanted by playing this music. It is a rare phenomenon about 150 documented cases, but it's real. It's mostly females, mostly young women. And though not always, it's mostly music they enjoy. Um, and the seizures are in the temporal lobe of the brain, which we generally think of as memory centers in the brain, but certainly are among the structures of the brain that are, are activated by music. Um, Stacy Gale ha has a happy ending. She underwent um, neurosurgery uh, and the foci of her seizure was retracted and she went on to live a productive life. Um, Sachs, who we heard from in the video with Henry, writes in his book, Musicophilia, um, and there are other reports in the literature of, of 
the condition of the book title, an insatiable desire to listen to music. One case in the literature describes a drug-induced musicophilia, but the case in Sachs's book is utterly fascinating. A surgeon vacationing with his family in, I think, upstate New York, if I remember correctly, um, goes to use a payphone. Gives you a sense of the timing of this. Um, goes to use a payphone nearby their cabin, uh, is walking across a parking lot, and is struck by lightning. He wakes up flat on his back to a nurse who happened to be there who had revived him. He says, it's OK, I'm a doctor. <laughs> she says, you weren't 30 seconds ago. <laughs> he goes to the hospital, EKGs, number of other tests, checks out OK. Seems like the only um, sequelae of having been struck by lightning is some exit wounds on his soles of his feet, burn marks. But when he goes home from vacation, he begins waking in the night, eager to go listen to classical music. This gives way to the desire to write and compose classical music. He buys a piano for his home. Thankfully, no one's going into seizure. Um, he buys a piano for his home. He's a surgeon. He starts spending all of his free time when he's not in the OR consumed by music. He ends up divorced. He ends up widely regarded as among the world's best amateur concert pianists. Something changed in his brain when he was struck by lightning and all he can think about is music. What about music as a treatment as compared to the malady induced by music that I've described to this point? There are hundreds of studies in the literature about musical therapies, music in, as an intervention. Um, one Cochrane review concludes that though the level of evidence is not gold standard, there is support for the idea that music may um, reduce the need for analgesic mechanisms postoperatively, that it may increase the proportion of people responding to pain medications, um, that it may accelerate recovery times after surgery. I love this case report from the neurological research a 63-year-old man who has had Parkinson's disease for eight years has been doing reasonably well taking Cinemet, still a drug use today, um, four times a day, amantadine twice a day. The only major problem is the patient has experienced a mark on-off phenomenon at times. He has been totally unable to initiate walking. The patient noted one day that he was unable to move while standing in his home. He felt as if his feet were glued to the floor. At that moment, on the radio, a Sousa march started to play, and the patient found that he was suddenly able to walk. Since that time, the patient has repeated this phenomenon on numerous occasions. He is now considering carrying with him a small tape recorder with march music on a cassette. If only we had small devices that could deliver personal music routinely to patients who needed them. Anybody recognize Gabby Giffords? Congresswoman shot during her tenure, um, suffered a left hemisphere brain damage as a result of her gunshot wound, similar to what a number of aphasic stroke patients experience um, when they experience a left hemisphere stroke. Gottfried Schlag at Harvard, at Harvard has produced a number of really important papers, fascinating work, using what he describes as melodic intonation therapy. Patients with a left hemisphere stroke become aphasic. They are often incapable of speaking after their cerebrovascular accident. They are also remarkably surprised to learn that they often can still sing. 
Whereas speech is predominantly a left hemisphere function of the brain, singing is located on the right hemisphere of the brain. And Schlaug determined that using common songs, common melodies like happy birthday, he could teach patients to use different words to the common melodies, slowly remove the melody, and essentially teach the right hemisphere to speak. Um, these images are from a, an expert, uh, forgive me, a, an untrained musician, a classically trained musician, and a left hemisphere stroke patient before and after um, melodic intonation therapy. And they suggest that the wiring of the brain after stroke is still plastic enough that the brain can reorganize itself to engender this capacity. What about music and memory? Um, I'll date myself here with one of my favorite all-time television shows, Cheers, which I think is a very nice introduction to music Thank you, and Diane. memory. Thank you, Diane. Now, Sam, you can learn about anything in this world if you'll just follow my little trick. Got it? Mm -hmm. All right. Albania. Here, Albania. Or should we say Albania? Why'd you say it like that? We learn our facts by associating countries with music. Why? Well, do you want to study alone? No, no. Right. No. One, two, three. Albania, Albania, you border on the Adriatic. Your land is mostly mountainous, and your chief export is chrome. You're a communist republic. You're a red regime. Sing it, Sam. Ready? How many of you Albania, remember learning your ABCs? Albania. I'll never forget that Albania borders on the Adriatic. Um, so, you know, music music has remarkable power to help us remember things. Um, I could tell you about the cranial nerves and how I use acronyms and beats to remember those uh, in my training. Um, can we use this? Um, actually, this is a study from UC Irvine, a 1993 nature study of the Mozart effect, this notion that young people who listened to Mozart scored three, point, three points better on IQ tests. There were, there were actually basic science studies that quote unquote replicated this finding, playing, playing Mozart to rodents in cages helped them do better on <laughs> spatial navigation tasks. Um, I, I'll say that I, I, um, this is a mixed literature. Um, I, I like classical music. I'm not sure it actually helps our testing unless you are a person for whom listening to classical music helps you better attend to the subject you're studying. Um, and there are numerous papers that have tried to, to deline delineate these concepts of musical improvement in cognitive performance versus musical improvement in the performance of, of learning. And um, I do think that for some people, lucky them, music can help them attend, focus, and, and learn. Um, but the Mozart effect is not terribly believed. Um, what about music and dementia? And, and this is really what I do. So um, the most common question we get when we do a talk like this is, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Dementia is a syndrome. It means that someone has cognitive problems, problems with their memory and other thinking skills that prevent them from living life the way they once did. They ultimately rely on others to complete their activities of daily living. And there are many causes of dementia. We sometimes describe it as an umbrella term. Um, thankfully, there are some treatable causes of dementia. Some patients who take too many medications or have malnutrition or hormone imbalance can be treated and after treatment they 
no longer meet the criteria for dementia. We study as yet untreatable causes of dementia, neurodegenerative diseases. And some are listed here, and actually some of them will appear again in this talk, specifically frontotemporal dementia or frontotemporal lobar degeneration. But overwhelmingly, the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. And when I say Alzheimer's disease, I'm talking about the biological underpinnings of what is happening in the brain of a person with dementia caused by Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease makes up an estimated 70% of all cases of Alzheimer's disease with the other neurodegenerative causes making up the mainstay of the remainder of cases. This is a huge problem in this country and in every other country around the world where people live to older ages, Alzheimer's disease is a public health crisis. There are nearly 6 million Americans living today in the United States with Alzheimer's disease. Some 15 or 16 million Americans are providing care to them. Two thirds of them are women. That is mostly because women are better at living to the ages when the risk for Alzheimer's disease goes up exponentially. But as you heard, we work closely with Maria Shriver's Women's Alzheimer's Movement and have a new initiative at UCI to try to understand why accounting for those age discrepancies does not fully account for the sex discrepancy and the risk for Alzheimer's disease. Certain communities seem to be at increased risk for Alzheimer's disease, specifically African Americans are estimated to be at double the risk. Latinos are estimated to be at 1.5 times the risk compared to older Caucasians. Importantly, our data are woefully lacking for these groups and for especially other groups like Asian Americans and the numerous cultural, ethnic, genetic subpopulations that make up races and ethnicities. This problem is massive, burdensome. The estimated cost of Alzheimer's disease in this country is approaching $300 billion. And because the fastest growing segment of our population is those older than 65 or older than 75 or older than 85, no matter how you define an older population, that's the fastest growing segment of our populace. Because the single greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is older age, we anticipate that the number of people with Alzheimer's disease will triple by 2050. This could cost a trillion dollars to our national healthcare system and this public health creates an imperative for researchers like me to develop ways of stopping this, but I never like, I never allow myself to lose sight of the personal impact of this disease. It's estimated that it costs a family $350,000 to take care of a loved one with Alzheimer's disease over the course of that disorder. And that ranges from six to 12 years, but we certainly hear stories about Alzheimer's disease lasting 20 years through the throes of dementia. What's the role of music in dealing with this crisis? I said that when I was at UCLA, I started a program to try to bring music to Alzheimer's patients, especially people in nursing homes. Why is that a good idea? There are actually fascinating reports in the literature about the preservation of music in Alzheimer's disease, especially as a form of dementia. Some of these cases are now dated. This one's from 1994 of a gentleman who could no longer tie his necktie, but continued to play trombone in his local Dixieland band with his friends. And he could still play the songs. Perhaps you've seen um, the HBO documentaries, the memory tapes, which actually Maria Shriver produced. There was a, a fascinating patient 
resided in a nursing home. One of his frequent visitors was his wife. He would introduce her to his girlfriend who also lived in the nursing home. <laughs> he didn't remember his family, but he toured in a singing chorale. Never missed a lyric, sung solos. This is a video sent to me when we started our program at UCLA. My dad has Alzheimer's disease. He's 79 years old. It's been about 20 years since he last played the drums, but I still wanted to give it a try. 10 minutes after making this video, he had no memory of our performance together. But yet, he can still make music like this. I wonder why. been 20 years that was a video she sent me of their first effort they ended up playing concert at his assisted living facility together she's pretty good too um, it was still there 20 years later why is that um, this is a really nice study relatively recently in the literature where this group put young people in the scanner and asked them to listen to older music they were trying to identify regions of the brain that were um, activated with long-term musical memories. And I'm not going to get into the details of the anatomy of it, but you see this red structure here. This is from the same study, but now in Alzheimer's patients, looking at maps of brain shrinkage or atrophy associated with, with the disease. You can see these uh, yellow and red areas highlighting where shrinkage is happening the most. And this is the medial temporal lobe that we, associated with, we associate with memory performance. So characteristic shrinkage of the brain, the pr long-term preservation of memory of music, untouched. How about hypometabolism, decreased brain activity in people with Alzheimer's disease? It's the parietal lobe, totally misses the long-term preservation of musical memories. How about beta amyloid? You may have heard of plaques and tangles. We think of the deposition of these hallmark pathophysiologies as, as part and parcel with Alzheimer's disease. Red, hot, most amyloid, yellow, little less. It's kind of a light blue here in this part of the brain. So perhaps this unrelenting attack under which the person's brain with Alzheimer's disease is experiencing isn't affecting the parts of the brain that stores their long-term memories for, for music. Even documented cases of patients being able to learn new musical information, new songs, and retaining those songs for months among people with Alzheimer's disease. Now, there are numerous reports in the literature about whether music can be used. Can we, can we bottle this? Can we, can we make a treatment for people with Alzheimer's disease? We know we can activate their brain with music. Does it do any good? Now, I, I, this is actually what I really do. I'm a clinical trialist. I want to find better treatments for people with Alzheimer's disease, preventions for these diseases. And I have to say, this is a very challenging literature to interpret. We have numerous Anecdotes, one of my favorite scientific quotes is the plural of anecdote is not data. <laughs> so we have numerous anecdotes in the literature, not unlike the ones that were sent to me when we started that program. This is my dad. This is him playing the drums. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. But it doesn't necessarily produce an evidence base by which we can make recommendations. So this is a difficult literature to to assess, there are not many studies that achieve our gold standard experimental design, which is a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled clinical trial. As you can suspect, designing those studies is challenging. What's the control for music? It's tough. Playing dissonant music that I played for you earlier doesn't sound like that much fun. 
um, dropout might be high in that study. Um, the other thing is the literature has lots and lots of different types of interventions and combining them is clearly not appropriate. So some are doing singing exercises, some are teaching people how to play musical instruments, there's rhythmic exercises and dancing, passive listening, these are administered in group settings versus individualized and one-on-one. -on -one. I'm very careful about using the term musical therapy because there's a society of musical therapists. They perform therapy and they incorporate music into their practice. That's not what I'm really talking about today. I'm talking about musical interventions. So these are difficult things and like any studies, we have to be very careful about sources of bias, small sample sizes, number of these studies report 20 different things that they measured in people who got music and one of them showed a benefit. That's also the probability of one thing showing a benefit by chance. And so it's difficult to interpret. Um, there are some studies in the literature though. I put this slide up mostly as an excuse to play Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Because one of my favorites looked at whether Vivaldi's Four Seasons improved memory performance in people with Alzheimer's disease. It didn't. So, just a beautiful piece of music. Unfortunately, I only have one slide about treating cognition in Alzheimer's disease with music as a treatment because my conclusion is that there's inadequate evidence to support the notion that Alzheimer's disease responds positively to music as a therapy to improve cognitive performance, memory, reaction time, decision making, I find no evidence to support music as an intervention to improve cognition in people with Alzheimer's disease. But cognition is actually not the only symptom of this disease. And perhaps more important to patients and families are some of the other symptoms that invariably come through the course of Alzheimer's disease, specifically behavioral symptoms. Depending on the study you want to cite, the frequency of behavioral symptoms in Alzheimer's disease ranges from 70 to 99% of patients. Categorized broadly, this includes apathy, depression, anxiety, and most notably for families, agitation, physical aggression. These are the hardest parts of this disease. Behavioral symptoms are frequently the cause of placement in skilled nursing homes. They can result in hospitalization and there are no FDA approved treatments for these types of symptoms. The pharmacologic therapies that are used carry black box warnings for sudden death and have limited evidence to support their use in the first place. The first line of treatment for behavioral symptoms is behavioral therapies, non-pharmacologic approaches, finding triggers that cause these things to happen. Knowing routine may limit the frequency of these. They often come toward the end of day in what's known as sundowning finding ways to not only avoid triggers, but to redirect patients, especially at those times of day, in an effort to reduce the, the frequency or severity of these symptoms. Um, this is where I think music may be most effective. There are lots of reasons why music could be effective. It could introduce um, new opportunities for Alzheimer's dementia patients to interact socially through music. It could introduce reminiscence by sparking some of those long-term musical memories. The exercise associated with singing and, dance and dancing could be good. There are clinical trials of aerobic exercise as possible therapies for Alzheimer's disease now. Perhaps it reduces stress but perhaps it's more than that. Perhaps it is that reward circuitry of the brain, the striatum, the nucleus accumbens. 
There are multiple hypotheses for why, from a neurophysiological standpoint, behavioral symptoms happen so frequently in Alzheimer's disease. One of them is what's known as a monoaminergic hypothesis. The most fundamental monoamine being dopamine. Dysregulation of the dopaminergic symptom of the dopaminergic signaling in the brain is hypothesized to play a role in the onset of agitation and other behavioral symptoms in Alzheimer's disease. Understanding different forms of dementia may help us understand the role of music in treatment. I alluded to frontotemporal dementia earlier. Whereas Alzheimer's patients may not remember the year, the artist, or even the title of a song, they still recognize the emotional context of that song. They may still have long-term memories of that song. In other forms of dementia, this ability can be lost. And this may underlie, be under, um, the underpinnings of this phenomenon may be from the striatum, orbitofrontal cortex, and other reward circuitry being affected in frontotemporal dementia compared to Alzheimer's disease. In frontotemporal dementia, the emotional recognition of valence for music, is this a happy song? Is this a sad song? Is this a scary song? Is often lost. And the correlation between that lost ability to recognize emotional valence is underpinned by these structural brain regions that Zatori identified as playing a role in the emotional response, the reward response to music. And if we compare the atrophy of these brain regions between behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, semantic dementia, which is uh, most frequently caused by one of these two underlying biological disorders, compared to control, people with Alzheimer's disease experience no greater atrophy in these parts of the brain than do controls, whereas patients with frontotemporal dementia who can no longer recognize the emotional context of music have had significant losses in these brain regions. The point here is that in Alzheimer's disease, even in late stages of the disease, the brain tissue, the brain response, the capability of listening to pleasurable music and responding positively through a chemical interaction release of dopamine into the reward circuitry of the brain may still be intact, even late in the disease. Now I said the plural of anecdote is not data, but I have to share some anecdotes that are typical of things that I heard from family members, and I'm sure people in the room today, when learning about our program. For years I've been telling people about how music helped my father in the last stage of Alzheimer's. He didn't know who we were, and we couldn't connect. He often was agitated. Then I'd put headphones on him with the Beatles music that he loved, and suddenly he was alert, calm, and would even talk to me a bit. A second person. When my mother-in-law was in a home and had dementia, I'd bring a recorder and headphones with her favorite music. Music over the loudspeakers just wasn't the same. The nurses would thank me profusely every time I'd visit, saying she is so much easier to handle. I was perplexed, thinking, how could they not know this? How could they not know the healing power of music? So again, thinking about the literature, trying to study music as an intervention is challenging. There are not a lot of great studies, and even the ones I'll point out to you today are imperfect. This is what's called a crossover design study. We're looking at data from three different uh, settings in the same people. So they're randomly assigned to the order in which they receive um, passive listening, sort of quiet um, classical music versus music that identified through family members they love. And we're measuring the frequency and severity of agitation in people with Alzheimer's disease. And what I hope you can see is that when people are listening to music, they love whatever it is, Mellow Mushroom, Beethoven, Pink Floyd, 
When they listen to the music they love, the response is greater in the form of reduced agitation compared to listening to classical music or nothing at all. Um, a study that tried to introduce randomization to groups in the nursing home setting, it was a study done in Asia, found that randomizing one unit of dementia patients to having nurses work with family members to do personalized music compared to randomizing a unit to playing classical music over the loudspeaker showed reductions in agitation and other behavioral symptoms when the personalized approach was used relative to when the general classical music over the loudspeaker was used. And most recently, a study that retrospectively tried to look at the impact of nursing homes incorporating Dan Cohen's music and memory program. So they looked at the overall performance at different nursing homes, dividing those homes into participating versus not participating in the in the music and memory program. The music and memory program brings people from the nonprofit organization with iPods and a knowledge base of how to create personalized playlists that can be delivered to nursing home patients. And what you can see is that the rate of discontinuation of anxiolytic medications is much greater. It's negative, meaning that uh, the rate goes down uh, uh, of discontinuation, which is a good thing. We want more discontinuation of these drugs more discontinuation of antipsychotics with a black box warning, um, reduced behaviors, and no difference in mood. Not a perfect study, not a randomized study, but an important retrospective analysis of implementing a program like this. So the question becomes, and my question is, do we need a dose of medication in order to introduce a benefit in people with Alzheimer's disease? Maybe music is just the beginning. And a lot of studies begin there. Maybe pleasant music is only an incremental improvement upon playing music at all. We may need pleasurable music, and most importantly, we may need intensely pleasurable or personalized music that can activate the nucleus accumbens, the caudate striatum, and increase dopaminergic signaling in the Alzheimer's brain. There are many benefits to this. Hopefully, in improving agitation and other troubling behaviors. I think from the first video, the professional caregiver taking care of Henry, through the woman who sent me the video of her and her father, we also saw a side benefit, an ancillary benefit, increased interactions between the person with dementia and their family members, their caregivers. We draw blood, cerebrospinal fluid, do MRIs and PET scans on people with Alzheimer's disease day in, day out, Maybe music could be a way to help us do those things. Maybe it could be used in the clinic to make it easier to get vital information about patients' pro uh, disease progress. Okay, I end every lecture by telling people how they can help us. I'm privileged to work at an NIH-funded Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and we need all the help we can get. So I end every community lecture by talking about what I call the three eights. And I think everyone is in a position to help us through at least one of the eights. You can donate, you can advocate, and you can participate. In California, we actually do have state funding res for research. Um, it's January. You're probably about, oh, two and a half months from thinking about taxes. Um, but when you submit your taxes, there is actually a, a tax checkoff for your state income filings where you can donate to Alzheimer's research in the state of California um, has a program to fund research uh, local to, to uh, our borders. Um, we also accept donations at our organization, of course. Um, I would encourage you to look at Music and Memory's website, and if this topic invokes passion in you as it does for me, you could think about donating to Dan Cohen and his organization who truly is trying to bring personalized music to every person in a nursing home in the United States and beyond. And they've done some incredible things so far. Every person can advocate. You can advocate for people with dementia. You can advocate for more research dollars. You can advocate for more resources for families who are in the throes of this disease. All of the above need much, much more if we're gonna tackle this mammoth crisis that comes to us from, from Alzheimer's disease and 
We're extremely proud to have Maria Shriver, the former um, First Lady of California, who just last week um, brought the Governor's Task Force on Alzheimer's Disease to UCI because there's a, there's a major undertaking to try to get better at helping families with these diseases. And lastly, you can participate. Um, at my organization, we are heavily invested in science to try to rid the world of Alzheimer's disease and other age-related neurodegenerative disorders. Believe it or not, the most consistent barrier we face to making progress is low rates of participation in studies. That's not unique to us. That is common to every area of medicine. And so we created a new tool to try to accelerate clinical research called the UCI Consent to Contact Registry, or C2C. The C2C is an online, confidential, safe, voluntary opportunity for people in Orange County to enroll, tell us about themselves, things like your age, whether you have a family history of Alzheimer's disease, the medications you take, and what kinds of things you might want or be willing to do in a research study so that we can match those people to studies happening at UCI. It's kind of like a dating service <laughs> for scientists. Um, we're very pleased that we now have more than 4,000 adults from Orange County enrolled in the C2C registry, but our goal is to get 10,000 and to be the seat for solving crises like Alzheimer's disease right here. And we have fantastic scientists at UCI who are eager to make bigger contributions. So in conclusion, I hope that I have convinced you that music uniquely activates our human brain. That the neuroscience of music is important and potentially important to Alzheimer's disease. Though the Alzheimer's disease brain is ravaged by plaques and tangles and indeed loss of neurons and synapses, synapses, the parts of the brain most important to musical memory and reward responses to music remain largely intact even late into this disease and therefore treating patients with personal pleasurable music may be a wonderful way to alleviate or reduce symptoms of agitation and other behavioral symptoms. A good scientific talk always ends with acknowledgments. Dan Cohen inspired me to pick up this topic. A number of investigators like Robert Zatori and Daniel Levitin instructed me with their writings. Um, and of course, I was drawn to this topic because I'm passionate about music. Um, no talent whatsoever, but a deep, deep appreciation. And this is the only talk where I have opportunity to show this particular photograph, which is my wife with the lead singer of my favorite band, The National. And the story is that I was um, in Baltimore at a meeting of the National Alzheimer's Centers um, I sit on a variety of committees, as you've heard, so generally I have to wake for 4 a.m. Pacific time starts to meetings when I'm doing this. And I'm sitting in one of these meetings at about 4.30 in the morning my time, and this photo comes across my phone. And it's my wife, she's actually quite pregnant there, um, with the lead singer of my favorite band. Now, I am from Cleveland, Ohio, born and bred. And all five members of the National are also from Ohio. And they invoke Ohio in many of their songs. Like me, they think they are quite happy to no longer live there. <laughs> and she took this photograph in Santa Barbara where she was attending a meeting and I said, did you tell him you're married to a person from Ohio who's brought you to countless of their concerts? And she of course responded, no, I just told him I've been to a bunch of their shows. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for your attention. I've left plenty of time for questions. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, thank everybody, you for coming.